Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Welcome to Asian Impact Webinar from the Asian Development Bank. I'm Shu Tian from Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Today, we've gathered economists from across the bank to discuss um, economic uh, outlook in developing Asia amid global headwinds related to Russia's evasion to Ukraine and persisting COVID-19 pandemic. Aggressive tightening by the US Federal Reserve also poses uncertainty to the recovery in the region, where many economists still lag behind their prepared pandemic trends. The ADB has just released today its flagship economic report, the Asian Development Outlook. We have here, to, uh, we have here today Dr. Abdul Abiyat, the Director of Macroeconomic Research Division in Economic Research and the Regional Cooperation Department. He will take us through the key messages in the report. With that, I would like to pass over to Abdul, who will share with us the key messages in ADO 2022. Abdul, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Grace, and good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. So let me start by summarizing the key messages in our report, in this Asian Development Outlook report that was released this morning. So really, as, uh, the, the, key, the key factor, uh, one of the key factors driving the recovery right now is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is rattling global financial and commodity markets. So let me begin with that. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine really has been rattling global financial and commodity markets and has really heightened uh, economic uncertainty a lot, even as the COVID-19 pandemic persists. Second, the highly infectious Omicron variant has led to spiking COVID-19 cases in developing Asia early this year. But higher vaccination coverage and Omicron's less severe health impact have allowed economies to remain relatively open, which means that uh, there's just been a small impact on economic activity. Against this backdrop, growth rebounded to 6.9% last year, led by strengthening exports. But recovery does remain uneven across economies and is largely incomplete. Fourth, Developing Asia is forecast to expand by 5.2% this year and 5.3% next year on increasing domestic demand and solid export performance. Inflation will rise to set 3.7% this year and moderate to 3.1% in 2023. Having said that, price pressures are increasing and monetary authorities should remain vigilant. Fifth, there are significant downside risks from the escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war to tightening global financial conditions and also continued risks from the pandemic, including the current struggles that the People's Republic of China has with, current, with outbreaks there right now and the possibility of more deadly COVID-19 variants. Finally, our report has a theme chapter titled Mobilizing Taxes for Development, which documents how the region needs to mobilize taxes to support spending in health, education, and other development areas. So let's, let me now take you through um, a deeper look at these issues. So as mentioned, the Russian invasion of Ukraine represents a major shock to the global economy. The red diamond uh, on the left chart, on the right side of the left chart, shows that just one day after the invasion, one measure of geopolitical risk that we show here spiked higher than the monthly peak reached during the Iraq war you know, almost 20 years ago. And you can see that spike in the blue line. Shockwaves from the war have unsettled global commodity markets. Oil breached $130 per barrel soon after the invasion. And though they've declined, um, prices are expected to average $107 per barrel this year, and we expect it to decrease only gradually and stabilize above pre-war levels over our forecast horizon. There have been similar spikes, not just in energy, but also in other commodities, including wheat, corn, and various metals. We discuss potential spillovers to developing Asia in a special topic section of our report. What is certain is that the fallout from the war is an additional hurdle for economies in developing Asia, which are, as I said, still contending with a pandemic. So turning now to the pandemic, the more infectious Omicron variant 
really has been driving recent pandemic developments, not just in our region, but around the world. In developing Asia, which is shown by the black line in the left chart, new daily infections declined from January to February, but then surged again to over 600,000 cases per day in early March. Fortunately, higher vaccination coverage and Omicron's milder health impact allowed authorities to keep containment measures rather relaxed. And as a result, economies fared relatively well. So just for the audience's information, um, about two thirds of developing Asia's population is now fully vaccinated. So as you can see in the table on the right, uh, talking about economic activity, purchasing manager indices for manufacturing and services have remained above 50. And that's the threshold that separates improvement from deterioration. So you can see that most of the sales in January and February are still green, unlike in uh, the middle of last year, where you had pink uh, and red cells indicating that economies were contracting. The one exception for over the last two months is in the, in the People's Republic of China, where tough containment measures as part of its zero COVID approach led to manufacturing falling below 50 in January. And actually it did so again in March in the data that was just released for March. So this softer start in 2022 follows a strong growth rebound last year. If you look at the blue bars in the left-hand side chart, they show that developing Asia's GDP expanded by 6.9% last year. South Asia and East Asia grew in the neighborhood of 8%, but growth lagged in Southeast Asia due to del Delta-driven outbreaks and the Pacific contracted for a second consecutive year. Recoveries are still incomplete and GDP remained uh, below its pre-pandemic trend in most economies. Together with effective pandemic containment that allowed domestic demand to recover, solid export performance was also a common driver of growth in the region. And you can see this in the chart on the right. Exports from developing Asia have become more broad-based both across different products, but also geographically. And that's what you see here. The red line in, this, in the right chart shows exports from the People's Republic of China stabilizing after coming down from record levels in early 2021. Exports from the rest of the region, which are shown by the green line, continued rising throughout last year. So turning to inflation, the dashed black line in the left-hand side chart shows that headline inflation in the region started increasing over the course of 2021. It reached 3.2% in December from 1.2% in January. That pattern of rising inflation was, is evident in all subregions of developing Asia, as you can see in that left chart. Having said that, the right chart shows that inflation in developing Asia is still well below the, uh, the levels prevailing in other parts of the world, including in the advanced economies. For example, the gray bars show that in December, inflation in the US stood at 7% and at 5% in the euro area. And in both of those economies, inflation rose further in the first months of this year. Headline inflation has also been much higher in other emerging economies at close to 10% in Latin America and the Caribbean, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and also emerging and developing Europe. Regional financial conditions remained robust last year, but they did start weakening in November on expectations of monetary tightening in the US. And they worsened further this year following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Between November and early March, average risk premiums in the region, measured by MB stripped spreads, which are shown by, uh, so the increase are, is shown by orange bars in the left-hand side chart, they've widened. Um, so again, all the red, all the orange bars are positive or almost all of them. And the increase has been most significant in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and some markets in the Caucasus and Central Asia where they surged uh, because of macroeconomic or war-related concerns. Subdued investment sentiment was also reflected in weaker portfolio flows which you can see in the green line in the right-hand side chart. If you exclude the PRC, 
the region actually witnessed net portfolio outflows for much of 2021, which is the blue line. But it's not a lot. I mean, especially if you compare it to what happened in 2020. Despite the weakening of portfolio uh, inflows, foreign direct investment, which are shown by the red dots in the right chart, remained resilient, reflecting solid medium-term fundamentals. With governments gradually unwinding pandemic emergency measures, budget balances as a share of GDP will rise in the region this year. And that's shown by the blue bars in the left-hand side chart. And we also expect it to rise in, uh, to, we expect further fiscal consolidation or improvements in fiscal balances in 2023. Those are the, um, the orange bars. But fiscal stances will remain accommodative. The diamonds show that most fiscal balances in 2022 and 2023 will be smaller than pre-pandemic averages. Turning to monetary policy with relatively manageable inflation so far, Monetary policy has continued to be accommodative in the region, with policy rates remaining at low levels in many economies. However, a few central banks have started tightening their stance since 2021, and you can see that by the orange and gray bars in the right chart. We expect other central banks to start tightening in coming months. So turning now to the outlook, with positive developments on the pandemic front and economies reopening, Solid exports and robust domestic demand will underpin continued recovery in developing Asia. GDP is forecast to expand by 5.2% this year and 5.3% next year, although growth will remain uneven across subregions. South Asia will continue to grow strongly, supported by robust domestic demand. Growth will pick up in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, normalize in East Asia, and slow in the Caucasus and Central Asia due to the fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Fiscal consolidations and possible interest rate increases in response to Fed tightening will complicate the outlook, while border reopenings will benefit tourism-dependent economies. The region's inflation rate is forecast to rise from 2.5% last year to 3.7% this year, and it'll accelerate in all subregions except in the Caucasus and Central Asia, where it's coming down from high levels. You can see this in the right hand side chart. Prices will increase by 3.1% in 2023. So, price dynamics are, are really being dictated by the impact of elevated energy and commodity prices, and of course, by the continued economic recovery. Monetary authorities in the region really need to be on guard against any incipient inflationary pressures. So while the base baseline forecasts are relatively good, several downside risks do cloud the horizon. Escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war would worsen the fallout in developing Asia via both direct and indirect channels. Persistently high inflation in the US might prompt sharper than expected rate hikes, which could trigger financial volatility, capital outflows, and depreciations in the region. Regional economies with heightened macroeconomic vulnerabilities could be significantly challenged by these negative uh, circumstances. COVID-19, of course, still remains a threat. Uh, the appearance of more deadly virus variants and the current outbreaks in China could endanger the region's recovery. And scarring from the pandemic remains a significant medium-term risk. Uh, one of the special topics in our report looks at uh, learning losses. And we, have, we project large learning losses from continued school closures, which actually threaten to exacerbate economic inequality. So the ADO takes a deeper look at these issues, and let me quickly discuss those two special topics uh, that we have. So as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a special topic on the impact of the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine on developing Asia. So what we find is that direct exposure is very limited for the region as a whole but economies in the Caucasus and Central Asia are important exceptions. The left chart shows that imports from Russia are equivalent to large shares of GDP in this subregion. Exposure is particularly large for Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, and Armenia, but also in Mongolia, which depends on Russia's refined oil. Exposure is smaller for exports to Russia, which account for about three to 5% of GDP in Armenia, Kazakhstan, 
Kyrgyz Republic, and Uzbekistan. What's important to note, though, is that for uh, many of these economies, uh, much of their exports, even to other countries, transit through Russia, and those that that uh, um, export path could be complicated by sanctions. The right chart shows that remittances are also important for this subregion and will be impacted significantly. The downturn in Russia will depress income for migrant workers, and the significant depreciation of the Russian ruble will further slash remittances in value terms. So for the rest of developing Asia then, the primary impact is actually indirect, particularly via commodity prices uh, and especially energy prices feeding into higher inflation. Economies where oil and gas imports account for large shares of GDP, uh, which you can see in the uh, left-hand side chart, uh, will be affected the most, uh, including Cambodia and many Pacific Island nations. So current account deficits uh, or balances will worsen for these economies. And uh, those for which transport, energy, and food are large in the CPI basket will tend to see bigger inflationary impacts. Meanwhile, energy exporters such as Brunei and Azerbaijan will gain from higher prices. Regarding uh, food commodities, uh, which are shown in the right-hand side chart, prices for wheat, the purple line, and corn, the yellow line, have soared um, because Russia and Ukraine are key global suppliers. Palm oil prices, which are shown in green, also surged because Ukraine is a large producer of sunflower oil and that those two products are substitutes. Importantly for our region, rice prices, which are shown in blue, have not risen much, uh, but fertilizer shortages and substitution from wheat may push uh, rice prices up. We also consider the possible impact of faster than expected monetary tightening in the US, which our simulation suggests could slow the pace of global growth and growth here in Asia. The Federal Reserve's communications on March 16, which was after the ADO report's data cutoff, are actually already more hawkish than our baseline assumptions. And these charts show how the more aggressive pace of tightening would affect our baseline forecasts. Growth would be slightly lower in developing Asia by about 0.2 percentage points this year and 0.1 percentage points in 2023. And inflation slightly higher because fe faster Fed tightening would result in depreciations of regional currencies. There is still a risk that the Fed will actually tighten by even more than it has already indicated. And our simulations also do not account for substantial, substantial quantitative tightening, uh, which, could, which may happen and for which there's really no historical precedent. Looking beyond the short run, we also updated our estimates of long term learning losses from school closures because of the pandemic. Our estimate is that 7% uh, of expected, 7% uh, of uh, a, stu a student's expected learning over their lifetime has been lost because of these school closures. Uh, and that assumes no remedial measures to recover lost learning. Obviously, if you have remedial measures, then you can, you can lessen those losses. This translates into expected losses in lifetime earnings for today's students of about $3.2 trillion. That's equivalent to 13% of developing Asia's GDP in 2020. What's more, the impact may exacerbate inequality. Uh, due to lower access to remote education and greater exposure to income losses during the pandemic, students from the poorest quintile, which are shown in the blue bar on the left chart, are expected to lose 33% more learning uh, and uh, uh, that would trans uh, than, than students from the Richards quintile, which are uh, uh, the, the orange bars. Disparities in productivity resulting from these learning losses could translate into a 47% wealth gap in earning losses over their lifetimes. Gender gaps in learning losses, which are shown on the right chart, could also result in, result in earning losses that are 28% higher for girls, the blue bars, than they are for boys, the orange bars, because of higher returns to girls' education. So let me uh, quickly summarize in a couple of slides our theme chapter on mobilizing taxes for development. Public spending in developing Asia, 
in public spending in developing Asia in areas such as education, health, and social protection is low, and it compares unfavorably with other developing regions and with advanced economies. Even before COVID-19, estimates suggested that public spending needed to be substantially increased in many of our economies to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. This, of course, implies a corresponding need to increase tax revenues for the region to achieve its potential. However, as the chart and the slide shows, while tax revenues rose in developing Asia over the past two decades before the pandemic, it remains comparatively low at averaging about 16% of GDP. This level of revenue was a little below Latin America and the Caribbean and well below OECD economies. Furthermore, with the onset of COVID-19, revenues declined sharply across the region. The relatively low level of revenue combined with large public spending demands and necessarily uh, fiscal repair after the pandemic points to an urgent need to better mobilize tax revenues. While difficult, tax reform is doable. The, this chart on this slide shows diverse economies in developing Asia that have successfully implemented reforms that generated some of the largest tax revenue increases anywhere over the past few decades. Experience shows how strong political leadership and public buy-in is essential for successful reform. There's really no one size fits all path to successful reform, but strengthening the value added tax or VAT and optimizing tax incentives is often part of an effective package. This is especially true in developing Asia where VAT is a very important uh, revenue source and where tax if incentives that for, uh, end up foregoing significant revenue uh, in many economies. Strengthening personal income and property taxes can also raise additional revenue and importantly promote equity. Uh, the chapter also talks about how environmental and corrective health taxes can raise revenues and contribute to the sustainable development goals. Finally, new analysis shows that reducing business registration costs can significantly expand the formal economy and thus the tax base and revenues. So let me just put up uh, the key messages. I won't read them again, but basically if I had to summarize the, the outlook for the region, it's that we do expect uh, things to look uh, pretty good considering all the global headwinds or all, all the global challenges that are facing the region now. So growth will remain relatively robust at above 5%. Inflation while rising is still rel relatively manageable, but those global challenges do suggest that policymakers in the region do need to stay on their toes, both to guard against inflation to re and to rebuild public finances and to ensure that this recovery that we're in uh, remains sustainable and inclusive. So let me end there, Grace, and pass the floor back to you. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for sharing the economic prospects and the related risk in the region. Uh, we will now welcome the audience to raise questions to Abdul and our panelists from a um, wide geographic span. Uh, they are Lanzafami, uh, Matteo Lanzafami, Senior Economist from uh, Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, Kenji Takamiya, Principal Economist from the Central and West Asia Department, and Du Cesara, Senior Regional Cooperation Officer from the Southeast Asia Department. Please kindly post your questions in the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. Um, Ab Abdul's presentation actually star, uh, started to discuss the, that uh, uh, Caucasus and Central Asia economies are the most affected by the Russians' uh, invasion of Ukraine due to strong trade and other ties. But such impact may vary across different regions, uh, different uh, uh, regional economies. For example, um, some economies um, are, e are exporters of commodities, including oil and gas, who will benefit from a price spike. Kenji, I would like to um, uh, invite you to comment um, on these issues. So do those um, um, hydrocarbon exporters gain or lose on net? And how does this affect uh, the outlook for the region? Thank you, Grace, uh, for the great question. Uh, in ADO 2022, the subregional GDP growth rate for the 
Caucasus and Central Asia is projected to slow from 5.6% 5, 5 in 2021 to 3.6% in 2022. Uh, while some of oil and gas exporters are expected to gain from higher hydrocarbon prices, uh, geographical tensions, uh, sorry, ge geopolitical tensions that impacts on others such as Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan may not be overall positive. This is because of their close linkage to Russian economy through trade and finance. For Kazakhstan, <coughs> Russian Federation accounted for over 40% of total imports and over 10% of total exports last year. In EBRD's projection, the Russian economy may, may contract by around 10% this year, and disruption to trade flow would be inevitable. Russia is also an important route, trade route for Kazakhstan, as about 60% of its trade uh, oil export is transported by a pipeline to the Black Sea port. In the financial sector, sanctions on large Russian banks affect their local subsidiaries operating with substantial presence is in Kazakhstan. With Uzbekistan, the number of migrant workers is expected to be cut by at least a quarter and remittance will be sharply curtailed due to economic sanctions on, on Russia. Foreign direct investment from Russia is also expected to drop. Thank you, this is all well picture. Thanks, Kenji. Um, I, I see a lot of questions coming in the Q&A box already. Uh, let's start with uh, the question from uh, Taka Nishimura. His question is, um, has there been any analysis on agriculture-based economies taking a hit due to Russia, um, which is a major producer of fertilizers, um, slowing uh, its uh, exports due to sanctions, perhaps even uh, famine for the LDCs and the um, MEDCs? Um, Abdul or Mateo, do you want to comment a word on this question? All right. So, I mean, it, it definitely is a big concern. So, um, uh, so fertilizer, one of the main ingredients in making fertilizer is natural gas and natural gas prices have uh, spiked tremendously. We have a chart in our ADO, it's not in the um, well, actually, it may have been in the in the slides I showed. So natural gas prices spiked uh, um, uh, very high, and uh, again because Russia is a uh, uh, one of the most important uh, suppliers of natural gas uh, globally, and uh, so one of the impacts would be on fertilizer and fertilizer prices. And yes, this will uh, likely impact uh, food prices. And I guess the question is really about whether food supply uh, might also be at risk. Um, so that's definitely something to keep an eye out on. What, where it is currently uh, feeding into our forecasts is in, in our inflation forecast. So for the region as a whole, um, uh, inflation is about maybe two percentage points higher than uh, what, we, what would have otherwise been the case if uh, you know, with, absent the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And really that, that one of the contributing factors to that is uh, these price pressures on, on, on the food side. Um, but yes, and so one economy that will likely be impacted by uh, rising fertilizer prices is India, which I think is one of the uh, with largest importers of, um, in fact, sorry, it is the largest uh, importer of uh, nitrogen fertilizer in the world. And so that it, that could put pressure on both uh, um, food production in India and, uh, and inflation in India as well. So let me stop there, Grace. Thanks, Abdul. Um, uh, we, we, see, we see other questions related to Russia, Ukraine war. Let's, uh, let, let me pick uh, another one from the floor. Um, there is um, a question from uh, Luis uh, Cardarin. Um, um, it's a question is, um, uh, you mentioned that the Russia war could impact overseas workers' remittances. Uh, is the Philippines including among those uh, that would adversely affected um, as um, I dot, well, the um, Lois dot, that there is a significant number of uh, OLFWs in Russia and Ukraine region. Uh, what are your forecasts for Philippines OL, uh, OFW remittances and the PESO? Also, uh, how do you uh, reconcile your forecast of lower remittances when you also expect the depreciation of uh, Asian currencies? Won't that be uh, counterintuitive? 
Okay, Adosi, do you want to say something on that? Sure, Grace. Okay, um, for remittances, um, surprisingly, the Philippines uh, remittances um, for the Philipp in the Philippines have withstood the the, the COVID nineteen. Now, um, what we're seeing is that there are um, increasing number of uh, uh, OFWs um, leaving the country simply because countries or the developing uh, the more advanced countries are opening up, so they're ready to accept more workers from the Philippines. So uh, for now, we don't have the, the numbers yet, but what we're seeing is that um, more of, our, of the Filipino workers are moving or going to uh, other destinations, so which is good. So it, it may balance the, the impact from those um, who are likely to be affected by the ongoing war. Thank you. Thanks, Dosi. Um, so let great, me pick before you take, just before yeah. you take that, I just want to build, uh, given that the question is on remittances, maybe there's some viewers also wonder what about remittances elsewhere. So we saw in the, one of the charts I showed um, uh, for certain economies in the Caucasus and Central Asia, uh, many of them have substantial remittances from Russia and Ukraine, mainly from Russia, uh, because they have many migrant workers in Russia. Um, apart from those economies, uh, many other economies, you know, are where uh, for whom remittances are important, uh, do not have uh, Russia or Ukraine as be, as being uh, primary sources of uh, remittance income. So in many cases, they're either from advanced economies or the Middle East or elsewhere. So um, uh, barring those uh, few economies I showed, uh, the remittance channel will probably not be that important for most of developing Asia. Thanks, Abdul. Um, there is another question from um, Rosamanita. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, do you have any short-term or long-term scenario planning in accordance to the Russia-Ukraine conflicts and the impact to the global commodity prices? Maybe I can try to answer that. So um, thank you, Grace. So we don't have a scenario. Uh, we consider the possible impact of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, as a risk to, to our outlook. And so our baseline is that there is going to be some kind of um, solution or compromise to the conflict sometime this year. And after that, um, prices for commodities, especially energy prices are going to stabilize and uh, gradually decline. Uh, the risk is that this is not going to happen. So the main risk is a, an escalation of the war, in particular, for example, involvement in the war uh, by, by uh, NATO countries. And that will clearly lead to uh, further uh, increases in energy, in energy prices, it will disrupt trade and uh, uh, global value chains much more than, than it has already uh, done. And uh, it could very likely lead to, to a recession in Europe, maybe even derail the, the global uh, recovery. So that's probably the worst case scenario uh, that we can consider in terms of the fallout of the war. Uh, at the same time, I mean, there are other, other scenarios that could uh, impact uh, developing Asia substantially. For example, an escalation of the sanctions, uh, especially by the European Union on, uh, on energy and uh, especially oil and gas. And this is a scenario that uh, is at the moment not very likely, but it became more likely yesterday because the European Union decided to ban coal imports from, uh, from Russia. And again, that, that's very important for, uh, for developing Asia because one of the direct channels that we mentioned in the special topic is obviously trade. And the European Union is a very important um, source of external demand for, for Asia's uh, exports. So about one quarter of exports uh, from, uh, from developing Asia uh, to outside of the region go to the European Union. So a recession in the European Union uh, following an embargo of energy uh, imports uh, from Russia will really have a significant impact in, uh, in developing Asia. And these are really possible alternatives uh, but not necessarily alternatives. These, these two different scenarios could be part of, of the same crisis. And uh, what we know is that this crisis uh, happened very, very suddenly. So this is a delicate situation. It's a situation in which geopolitical risks are, are significant. Can I just add to what Matteo said, uh, Grace? I mean, so even if uh, the conflict itself, you know, it sort of reaches some sort of equilibrium later this year, uh, 
the sanctions are likely to stay. In fact, that this, this is the assumption uh, we have that the sanctions are likely to uh, remain over the, our forecast horizon. And therefore, at least, you know, just to get to the uh, question that was asked, I would say it's reasonable to assume that commodity prices are going to remain elevated, which, which is our assumption over the forecast horizon. So remain elevated and possibly rise even further. Thank you. Thanks, Abdul. Um, we, we have another question from uh, Dennis Hu. Um, the question is, uh, do you see supply chain disruptions continue to persist for the most of 2022? How would that impact growth prospects? Abdul or Mathieu, do you want to comment I I on that? It. Oh, I can take it? Okay. <laughs> Please, Mathieu. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I, I just thought he said he would take it. Um, the, what happened with the disruptions in uh, uh, supply chains is essentially a byproduct, if you want, of the of the strong global recovery last year. So what we saw was a, a, a strong redirection or rotational demand uh, towards goods uh, from uh, from services, and this happened especially in advanced economies. I mean, we've seen this happening in the U.S. And we've seen also the effect that this had in, uh, in spiking um, inflation or increasing inflationary pressures in uh, in the U.S. So. As the global economy continues to adjust uh, to living with COVID, continues to adjust uh, to, to the pandemic, we think that these disruptions are gradually going to uh, dissipate. They are proving to be much more persistent than initially thought. Uh, so we see these disruptions continuing uh, this year as well, are starting to, um, as I was saying before, gradually dissipate. Um, however, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is also having an impact on uh, uh, supply chain disruptions. And we already mentioned some of these um, with respect to fertilizers. So, so there, there are going to be problems in the, in the supply chains related to, to food imports and exports. Uh, but others are also, um, other shortages are, are also going to rise because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, for base metals, for example, palladium, nickel uh, have been a lot in the news. Uh, but that, another key component is neon gas uh, that is uh, uh, produced and exported in, uh, in Ukraine. And this is a key element in the production of semiconductors. So the semiconductor industry, so the production of cheap essentially can be uh, affected. And obviously this is an input in so many other electronic products. Just think about the automotive industry, for example. So all of these are, are um, elements that are going to um, have an impact on uh, the supply chain disruptions. On the one hand, we expect things to improve because the economy and the recovery are gradually adjusting to, to the pandemic. On the other hand, there is going to be an impact from, uh, from uh, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Having said all that, um, we have also to notice that supply disruptions have been much less severe in uh, developing Asia uh, for a number of reasons. The, the rotation of demand from goods to services that I was mentioning before happened to a lesser extent in, in developing Asia. So demand was put in less pressure on uh, supply in, uh, in our region. Um, Supply chains also prove to be more resilient. Uh, logistic, uh, logistics are more efficient or prove to be more efficient in, uh, in developing Asia than, uh, than in the rest of the world. And also the position of many economies in the supply chains, uh, several economies in developing Asia are really upstream in the value chain. That means that they are not as affected as other economies which are in the, in the downstream. And at the same time, also the containment of the pandemic in developing Asia meant that, for example, labor shortages were not um, a huge problem in, in the most of the economy, uh, economies during, uh, during last year. So all of these factors are going to remain uh, in terms of the, the structural advantages that economies have in developing Asia. But the big question mark, as I was mentioning before, is the fallout from, uh, from the war in Ukraine. Thanks a lot, Matteo. We, we got a lot of questions uh, on uh, Southeast Asia, so now I would like to go to Dossi. Um, Dossi, um, there is a question from Tobias Thomas. Um, it's about Philippines. How long will the effects of inflation and increasing uh, prices of commodity caused by the Russia-Ukraine crisis are likely to last on the Philippines? Also, what specific reason is there for the forecast of GDP growth in the Philippines to be maintained at 6%, the same as in December, considering that uh, um, very different conditions now? Thanks, Dose, please. Okay. 
Uh, so we're going uh, specific to the Philippines now. Um, you know, when we did our forecast for the region, um, um, including the Philippines, we have incorporated the, you know, the inflationary pressure coming from the um, building up from higher oil and commodity and food prices. So for the Philippines, um, being a, an oil importing country, so that has a huge impact and that, that has been incorporated. But then, you know, um, we, we did, uh, we we used whatever was available at the time. You know, there's a data cut off, and but now we are seeing a more additional pressure on inflation, and um, we are we have um, um, a forecast right now is at 4.2 percent, but it may go up. It, it we will adjust it um, depending on how big the impact is. But then um, it is a huge. Uh, it will affect. Um, inflation in the country simply because of the the rising uh cost of oil you know we we were looking at 70 dollars per barrel in 20 it, it was at 70 dollars per barrel in 2021 but now we're looking at um 100 above 100 dollars per barrel and that has a huge impact on the budget you know of the the of the government because um it has a it was using a, a lower a um, uh, price or crude oil price for for budgeting this year, and now that the, the impact you know it's affecting um, the most vulnerable groups. So the government has to put in place um, targeted fiscal response to those vulnerable groups. So we we it it, it is having an impact. I mean across the sub region, um, we are feeling the impact of the rising. Uh, global prices in food, commodity, and uh, energy. Thank you. Grace, can Thanks. I follow up on, on yes. what uh, Dulce said? So, so Grace, uh, Dulce already talked about uh, inflation, and yeah, so that, that's something to be monitored and how uh, these uh, rising commodity and energy prices will feed into Philippine inflation. I just wanted to talk about that second part of the question about uh, the growth forecast for the Philippines. So yes, on the one hand, uh, you know, the, uh, in December, the forecast didn't have uh, the the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, and so why hasn't the forecast changed? Okay, so one is that, as I said earlier, in terms of the growth impact on uh, uh, on the region, well, so it'll be big on uh, many and several economies in the Caucasus and Central Asia. But for countries like the Philippines, if you look at trade linkages with Russia and Ukraine, they're relatively small. You look at, uh, at uh, financial linkages, they're also relatively small and um, uh, let's say remittances. So, so in terms of direct channels of impact, it's not a lot. And so it, it will work through uh, uh, those prices. And so, so it's really primarily through inflation. So uh, the other thing is that what else has changed apart from the Russia-Ukraine war? Well, it turns out that Omicron uh, is uh, not as severe. And as you can see now, uh, you know, the Philippines is really starting to opening up. Uh, there's a lot more uh, economic activity taking place. And, there, and that's, so, so there's, there's an offsetting factor that uh, opening up uh, from, you know, the, from COVID uh, is, is taking place and that's going to uh, allow domestic demand to to uh, recover, so both consumption and investment. Thank you. Thanks, Abdul. Uh, further to this question, uh, we have a question from Justin, uh, Justin Lim. Um, with inflation remain manageable for developing Asia compared with other regions, do you see the needs or rush for tightening in monetary policy for central banks in developing Asia this year? Mateo or um, Abdul, do you want to comment on this? I uh, Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as as the question starts by saying that um, inflation is still manageable, so we we forecast an increase in the um, the inflation rate to three point seven percent, which is higher definitely than uh, than last year, um, but it's very low compared to what we are seeing around the world. So. 
let's start by saying that that it, it, it still is manageable. The reason why is a, is a you know number of factors. Uh, we mentioned already, and Abdullah mentioned during the presentation that the recovery in developing Asia is still uh, largely incomplete in uh, in most of the economies. So you have significant slack still uh, in uh, in the economy, and that means that inflationary pressures, especially for core inflation, um, are not very high. At the same time, last year, there were a number of other factors which were pushing inflation higher in, in um, uh, the rest of the world, but actually acted as downward pressure on prices in, uh, in developing Asia. One major factor was, uh, was food prices, for example, for staple foods like, like rice and, uh, and pork. Um, prices were very low, or even uh, we had deflation in, in some cases, for example, in the PRC for, for pork prices. So that's a, a second element. The third element I already mentioned before is related to uh, the less severe impact of supply chain disruptions in, uh, in developing Asia with respect to the rest of the world. So all of this means that, again, performance with respect to last year in terms of inflation in developing Asia was, was better than the rest of the world. However, we, we don't want to um, send across the message that monetary authorities can be complacent. So they can you know, um, think that there, there, there are no problems because in the rest of the world, we've already mentioned this several times uh, today, uh, inflationary pressures in the global environment are increasing and they are increasing very substantially. We could be in the midst of a, of a um, historical uh, increase in, uh, in commodity prices. So that's something to keep an eye on, and uh, um, that's something to anticipate for, for central banks in, uh, in uh, developing Asia, because they, you definitely don't want to fall behind the curve in a situation like the ones that we are in right now. It's a global crisis, uh, high energy prices are going to have an impact on inflation sooner or later in developing Asia as well. So monetary authorities really need to, to anticipate this and be very vigilant. So, uh, yeah, so thank, uh, just again to add, um, I think the key there, what Matteo said, is you, know, you don't want to fall behind the curve. And I think the, what happened to the U.S. Federal Reserve is a cautionary tale. Uh, early last year, it, they were also saying, oh, this is going to be transitory. Um, and then you know, they, they did fall behind the curve. And I think the key for our central bankers is to look at whether inflation is becoming more broad based in your economy, right? So it, it, it complicates things when you have energy prices and food prices uh, going up so rapidly, but these are volatile components. They go up and then they go down. Uh, and so, which is why there's, it's important to focus on core. And the, the, the key though, is that it can shift very quickly, which is what happened in the US. Initially, it looked like it was just transport, uh, uh, the transport component in US inflation that was rising, but within a few months, it had broadened to other categories. And so that's the same thing that our central banks need to look at. Um, to what extent is it just focused on energy and food uh, or to what extent is it starting to spill over into other categories and also importantly into wage growth? Thanks. Um, thanks, Abdul. Um, okay, next, let me let me direct uh, one question to Kanji. Uh, there is a, a question in the Q&A box that uh, from Iskandar um, Abdul, uh, Abdullah. Um, it's the question is, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict will affect the trade corridors of Central Asia. Would this maybe increase attractiveness of uh, Central South Asia corridor development? What is your view on that? Kanji, any comments? Uh, yeah, I think any alternative trade routes could be a possibility. So, so we should uh, look into that. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, um, uh, raise one interesting issue of, of geographical attractiveness. Although we uh, we um, think that the, the net impact on on, on this this uh, geographical geopolitical tensions on on Caucasus and the Central Asia will be negative, overall negative, um, or tends to be negative. There's some uh, positive light uh, uh, that is a uh, huge labor movement or, or my uh, people movement to Caucasus countries and, and from Russia and Ukraine and some other uh, countries of the region. And those people tend to be uh, high skilled workers. So in the long run, it may, uh, help raise the productivity of these countries. Uh, and at the same time, it may partially compensate for the loss of tourism uh, that, that, that these countries are suffering. So I just wanted to add this element that the, the uh, 
uh, well, we're in the sort of dark, but there's still a bit of light uh, that, 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 that might have enhanced part of the attractiveness of these countries. Well, overall, the, the impact would be negative. Thank you. Thanks, Kenji. Oh, we have um, uh, questions from the PRC and we have a question from uh, Jizong Zhang. Um, what is your baseline assumption on China's uh, uh, pandemic control policy when ADO projects grow growth for China and developing Asia, given that, well, Chinese government is still implementing a zero tolerance policy right now. Mateo, you are the expert uh, in East Asia. Maybe you would like to address this comment, this, this question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the expert, but... <laughs> Um, so our assumption with respect to the PRC uh, and the current outbreaks is that they are going to be controlled. Um, we don't have obviously a timeline, but uh, the baseline is that this is not going to lead to, um, you know, it's not going to derail uh, uh, the recovery in, uh, in the PRC. It's obviously a very difficult moment in terms of the number of cases and in terms of the spike in the number of daily cases is probably the worst uh, moment with respect to the pandemic control in the PRC since uh, the early 2020. So we do expect that this is going to have an impact uh, on uh, economic activity early this year. As Abdul was saying, we already saw uh, with the March uh, Purchasing Management um, Index, which is a leading indicator of economic activity that it dipped below the 50 value, which, which uh, distinguishes uh, contraction from uh, from expansion. So we are already seeing these disruptions, and uh, um, I guess we can, you know, um, reading the news already have an idea of what is happening in Shanghai. For example, we know that um, there are significant disruptions in the in the port of Shanghai, where normally 100 ships are on average waiting to to be docked, and now the number is uh, three times as high. So these disruptions are definitely going to have an impact on uh, activity early this year. But we, um, in our baseline, consider that this is going to be controlled and, uh, and things are going to improve. Economic activity is going to pick up um, in, uh, you know, as, as the year proceeds. Um, we do highlight the possible disruptions as a risk to economic activity in the PRC, to growth in the PRC, and obviously because of the importance of the PRC as a risk for, uh, for the outlook uh, uh, to the region uh, as, a, as a whole. Abdul, maybe you want to add something. You're probably more of an expert than me on the PRC. I think that. <laughs> okay, um, the next question um, is from Cindy. Um, the question is, is Asia about to experience uh, stagflation? Maybe Abdul, you wish to comment on this one? Sure. Um, you know, stagflation might be an appropriate term for describing what might, where the U.S. might be heading. Again, <laughs> inflation close to 8% and uh, some indicators signaling that there might be possibilities of recession. It uh, might also uh, be used to describe what might happen in Europe, but I don't think it's, it's the right term. It's far from the right term for describing Asia's outlook right now. As I said, growth is quite robust at above 5% this year and next year. Inflation, while rising, is still manageable. And therefore, so yeah, again, sort of, it's hard to describe uh, you know, growth of higher than 5% as stagnation, which would be one component of um, stagflation. And again, it, you know, 3.7% growth and, that, and, it, and moderating after that uh, in our baseline forecast is also sort of not uh, the kind of inf inflationary, uh, or not, it's not the inflationary numbers you think of when you talk about st stagflation. So really, I think, uh, I hope uh, viewers take away that uh, Asia is actually pretty well positioned despite all these global challenges that we face. Thanks, Abdul. And the panelists, um, very comprehensive and vigorous discussion. Uh, we are running almost for one hour. We still have a lot of questions left unanswered, but I'm afraid we have to leave them there today. Uh, for your information, um, both the full ADO report and then the webinar recording will be available on ADB's website at www.adb.org. Uh, before we conclude, 
I wish to let you know that uh, our next Asian uh, Impact Webinar will be held on 6 May. It is on entrepreneurial uh, resilience during COVID-19. And we will have four panelists to show the diverse ways that entrepreneurs see their business through the worst of time. And it is an opportunity to see a lot of discussions on entrepreneurial related issues. Uh, please go to ADB uh, website to register for the event. And we look forward to seeing you again on May 6th. Um, six. This leaves me to thank everybody for participating in uh, today's webinar. And also thanks to our panelists today, Mateo, uh, Mateo Abdul, Kanji, and uh, Dosi. See you next week and stay safe.